my favorite lift ride ever for quick lift commercial. Um, what was was a ride from from a lady who told me she was never going to drive for lift again. I was the general manager for Lyft for the last two years here for Northern California. Um, it was an interesting time to be there. Uh, certainly we saw a lot of growth, a lot of change. Uh, it was a remarkable experience, enjoyed that quite a bit. And while you were at Lyft, you developed three models that actually impacted driver productivity and payments. Can you talk a little bit about those? Not only is there a competition on the demand side um, for passengers, but there's also competition on the supply side. Everybody here knows that most drivers drive for both Lyft and Uber or uh, multiple rideshare <laughs> companies at the time. At the time, Sidecar was still, was still around. Um, and, uh, and we tried to figure out, you know, what is a cost per ride? What is the average ride length? What are common ride routes, et cetera, et cetera? Um, but there's, there's multiple externalities that impact all of those data, right? Things like rainstorms, construction, the Giants making the playoffs, major events like um, Oracle World or so on and so forth, right? The Pride Parade, which Bru is dumb as SF. Don't even start it. <laughs> it was one of my, ha one, I'm happy, one of the reasons I'm, I'm happy I'm not lived is I don't have to deal with Pride. Uh, or like, not even Pride, the Pride, like those major events just shut down Market Street, because it, 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 as everyone here knows, uh, it debilitates the city from a transportation perspective. And, and so, as we thought more about where is the demand coming from? And how do we service the demand in those key moments of time? The strategy was really around how do we get people to not switch? Right? We're unlikely to be the first, at the time, the first uh, app downloaded. Most people have probably already downloaded Uber. And they're like, OK, there's some reason to try downloading Lyft. Now, it could be a coupon dropped on them. It could be they saw a billboard. It could be their friends. It could be. Um, you know, a combination of those things and, of course, like the culture and all those things sort of play into it. But how do we make their first experience exceptionally good? And the first experience has to be not just their first experience, but then everyone else's experience, too, right? It doesn't matter if your first experience is fantastic if your second one's terrible, right? And so now it's not just how do you optimize for the first person's ride or a new customer's first and second rides. So if third ride's terrible, then, like, you know, you've kind of lost a little bit of credibility there. So... So the question is not how do you optimize for a segment of the population uh, of your customer base. It's how do you elevate your overall service levels. Uh, and so we did a lot of work that now retrospectively looks unbelievably obvious, um, which is a, uh, a longitudinal ge like geotemporal analysis of rides uh, and fulfillment rates. And what that means is 8 a.m. on Monday morning in the marina is a much more valuable moment than 3 a.m. on a Wednesday morning in Pacifica, for example. Many more requests. People who are much more frequent riders, et cetera, et cetera. Right? And so as we, as we think about parsing this out, you can go to an nth level of detail, 8 to 815, 8 to 810, 810 to 820. What is the right level that you should be going to um, to help induce that? right? And the secondary question is, how valuable is it to retain a, a rider? And what does a rider's ridership actually look like? Now, I used to live in Russian Hill. Um, and prior to, uh, to joining Lyft, um, I would ride probably three times a week. I would commute three times a week to the city, or uh, to my office, which was in the mission at the time. But you have no idea your, what your wallet share is at that point. Right? And many companies that you will join don't know their wallet share. Even Coke doesn't know their share of wallet. Actually, Coke defines it differently. They call it share of stomach, uh, which, which I think is really interesting. Um, so, so we took this geotemporal view of where is demand generally coming from, where is supply generally positioned, and how do we reposition supply around demand, and what are the incentives we should be putting in place. And so uh, has, any, has anyone here driven for Lyft or Uber? I've been a lot. I've been in a lot. So I, I'm, I'm not an active driver anymore, but I was an active driver at the time. And it, it's interesting how incentive-oriented, and I've, of course, talked to thousands of drivers, it, how incentive-oriented folks are. And this should be no surprise also. right? Folks are incented by, uh, or, or uh, behavior is driven by incentives. Right? And so now, are these long-term incentives? 
short-term incentives, super short-term incentives. Are they week-long? Are they daily? Are they hourly? Are they per ride? Right? And so now you have a, a series of variables there that you can start testing. And this was the this was the fun part. This was like the super fun part is um, not just identifying, okay, supply demand, here's where it's happening, here's how it's evolving over time. When rain happens, then we see demand kind of shift or different sort of allocations. But then what incentives are, 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 are incentivizing what types of drivers? There's multiple types of drivers. There's the weekends only, nights only, full-time drivers, evening only, so multiple segments of drivers, et cetera, right? Um, some drivers earn for a full-time living. It's a very small percentage of rideshare drivers. Most drivers are part, what we call part-time drivers, uh, where, where um, the income they earn from rideshare is supplemental. And so if their income is supplemental, how do you have them optimize when and where they're driving? That's very, it's a very challenging thing, right? Many times drivers will just turn on their app and wait for a pay. And they're sitting in their driveway in Pacifica, or Daly City, or, you know, Russian Hill. So how do you convince them, hey, you should actually be going to the marina and positioning yourself to then be able to take these rides? And how do you think about incentivizing them to go back there afterwards, right? And what do those incentives look like? over a longer period of time, knowing that they could very well turn the app off as soon as that ride's done, and then not be on until the weekend, or until the next week, or, or late. So, so again, like, there, there's this really like, uh, rich set of data around how do you incentivize driver behavior? And, and I'm gonna say that in a way that sounds somewhat crass, but the reality is that that, that is what it is, right? Like, you're trying to incentivize a certain behavior and reward that behavior um, with different types of per ride, per set of rides, like over a period of time, let's say rush hour. If you complete this many rides during 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., you will earn this bonus. And we will tell you where to go because we know what the demand is. Or a week, if you complete this many rides in a week. Right? Yeah. And if you want to complete this many rides in a week, you can very quickly do the math of driving between uh, you know, 1 a.m. and 7 a.m. is not going to get you that volume. You need to drive between 7 and 9 and then 3 and 6. Right? And so helping drivers figure that out and optimize it for themselves um, uh, was an interesting problem. Like my, my favorite Lyft ride ever, first quick Lyft commercial, um, was, was a ride from, from a lady who told me she was never going to drive for Lyft again after that night. Um, and, and she knew who I was. I mean, the GM's picture is on every email that gets sent out, so she knew that I worked at Lyft. Yeah. Um, and I was like, it's interesting. Why, why are you never going to drive for us again? Like, what? And in my mind, I was what like, what, do? what do we do? And she goes, no, I finally saved up enough money to, I'm a single mother, I finally saved up enough money to go to uh, the police academy. And I want my daughter to be really proud of me. And I was like, that's awesome. Please never drive again. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it, it was very fulfilling in a lot of ways to be able to provide, um, you know, a secondary income for, for a lot of folks that help them achieve some different goals. So now diving into the hard questions. Um, Lyft and Uber um, do have um, self-driving car teams. Mm. Do you think that um, a fully autonomous future is close? Um, no, I don't. Uh, fully autonomous is, is really difficult um, for, for a host of reasons. And when I say close, I mean like within the next five years or ten years. So I think one thing is to define the time frame. Um, what and do you think is the more appropriate time frame? 20 to 30. Okay. Um, but I do think in our lifetimes, uh, fully autonomous will exist. And by fully autonomous, I also mean every city, every you know, region. How, how many people here are not from the United States? How many people here are from the U.S.? How many people are immigrants? In your home countries, you guys can pick, think of the towns. I'm from India. I was born in India. Like, my, my dad's town and my mom's town, there's zero chance there's going to be an autonomous vehicle, you know, getting to my dad's, uh, you know, my dad's village in, in Maharashtra anytime soon. Um, it, uh, so fully autonomous to me means that, right? I think it's a very high bar. Um, and, but, but I think that it is in the future, right? Um, I think part of your question is, um, what does that mean for on-demand or gig economy workers or yeah. people who start to rely on um, some of these jobs as part of their... You know, part of their income, and the reality is, um, there's enough complexity, at least for the foreseeable future, in things like rideshare that uh, I don't foresee this um, impacting the need for drivers. In fact, I think rideshare is still less than like two percent of all miles traveled um, by vehicle 
um, um, in, in even the major centers um, uh, of the U.S. And so, yes, it's still a very nascent industry in a lot of ways. Um, but the complexity of what's happening on our roads is only increasing, right? And what I mean by that is, um, man, I was even driving down uh, Townsend earlier today. I haven't been on Townsend Street in a long time. Townsend, right near Fort McKing, that's on the north side. And, like, they blocked off, like, an entire lane for a bike lane, and then they put a parking lane in there, right? And so there's these changes around how do we have a multimodal city that allows for bikes, scooters, uh, cars, uh, plus. And so as long as these changes are happening, and we're still, like, trying to figure out what the, um, what the multimodal transportation mechanism of the future is, um, and I think flying cars are, are a ways away, um, probably further than fully autonomous, um, you know, there will always be a need for drivers and for a human element of making these, these decisions of X, Y, and Z. Like, should I turn left? Should I turn right? Should I swerve to avoid the car running or the dog running into the road? Um, and, and, and those people will need to be compensated for their time, right? And so the hope of Lyft and Uber change, fundamentally changing their P&Ls by reducing their driver costs mm -hmm. um, are, are no time in the immediate future, in my opinion. 